Rolling Dice and Taking Names is sponsored by The Broken Token, creator of high-quality gaming accessories and storage solutions. Visit them online at thebrokentoken.com. Hey, y'all. Better grab that moon pie and RC because it's a special episode of Rolling Dice and Taking Names. As part of Tabletop Showcase, Martin Wallace joins the guys to talk about his career as a game designer. Plus, we'll get an inside look at his new game, Wildlands, from Osprey Games. Welcome to a special episode of Rolling Dice and Taking Names. This is episode 155, Last Train to London. My name is Marty. And I'm Tony. And Tony, you picked a great song for this episode because Last Train to London, number one, is from my, one of my favorite bands of all time, Electric Light Orchestra. And granted, this is a deep cut. It's not a song that will be on the greatest hits anywhere, but it fits really well with what we're doing today as we're interviewing the designer, for Tabletop Showcase, Martin Wallace, who is the designer of a game called London and designer of train games. He designed some incredible train games. And for those who don't listen to the show, first off, I love all train games. Okay, almost all train games. So I was very excited to have Martin Wallace on the show. We always name our shows after songs. And this one, you know, like you said, it fit. I, I didn't have to grasp like I did our last episode where I did something called Last Trees, October Trees. Oh, that, that was bad. That was awful. At least it was October, but this fits really well. And it happens to be one of my, actually one of my favorite groups. So I am excited to be able to talk to uh, Martin, who uh, we had to set up at a special time to talk because he now lives in Australia. We're on the East Coast of the United States, but we made the uh, t the strings between the tin cans work and, and we got this thing out. I mean, it wasn't weird times either. You know, our night, his day, it all worked. It did kind of feel like we were doing a little Doctor Who thing, maybe a little time warp, a little time jump. <laughs> we were, because we were talking to him tomorrow. I know, that was wild. <laughs> I wish he could have told me what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or he could have told us what, like what uh, ball games we should have placed bets on that day. We hey, could have won a lot of money. That, you're absolutely then we could right. have done the whole Back to the Future thing. So Martin, we talked to him. We had a great time. Just want to make sure everybody understands that we're not used to having such celebrities on the show. I mean, yeah, we've got we've had some designers, but we've never had a Hall of Famer. Well, wow, hold on, hold on. That's what? kind of insulting to all the designers we have had on the show. We've had some good ones. Yes, we have. And I'm and I'm kidding around because as we'll find out during the interview, I mean, Martin's got some distinguished awards here. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. But you know what? Instead of uh, teasing it, why don't we just let people hear? from Martin himself, talk about not only uh, his life and his history, but the game that we're here to discuss for Tabletop Showcase Week, which is Wildlands. We are excited to have for the first time on our show, and probably the last time on our show. Oh, come on now. <laughs> Well, we'll see how this goes, Tony. He might not want to come back when we're, when we're done. We'll, we'll, we'll hope he'll have a good time with us. But welcome to the show, Mr. Martin Wallace. Hi, hi, Marty. Hi, Tony. Thanks for inviting me on the show. M Marty, he's going to come back because he can make fun of our accents. You know, uh, yes, he yes. can. He has a proper English accent who now lives in New Zealand, which also has some very cool accents. And we're just two uh, uh, Southern boys with our hickey accents. Uh, no, I need to correct you there. Uh, I actually live in Australia. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you, it was New Zealand. You, you, okay. You have Australia. to keep up. Right. I, I move around a lot, but uh, no, I've been in Australia for almost exactly a year now. But New Zealand's right beside Australia, right? Hmm? Yes. From what I remember and lis listening to some other interviews, Distinguished Talent Visa. I thought that was for New Zealand. Or was it for Australia? Uh, that's for Australia. Um, that's New right, Zealand. Marty. Distinguished Talent here, buddy. Distinguished. Yes. Martin, you have, you've really lowered the bar then to come on this show. We hope <laughs> they don't come back and take it from you when this is over mm. with. No, I, I think fortunately, the only thing that I can do to really mess things up is if I go out and kill somebody, then they might kick me out of the country. So I, I'm pretty oh, safe. Oh, okay. Well... <laughs> So <laughs> I think we're going to be pretty safe then. Yeah. But you live in the country that has what the seven deadliest snakes in the world. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> fortunately it's not full summer, so you don't see many of them around. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that can kill you over here. <laughs> 
<laughs> that sounds like a place I want to visit. I do remember uh, years ago when I, before we moved over, a German friend of mine, the guy who edits Spielbox, uh, we were at a do together somewhere in Germany. And uh, he, he said the same thing. He said, but they have the top 10 deadliest creatures in the world. And I said, yeah, and when my wife gets there, it'll be 11. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> but on boom. Yeah. <laughs> have, you, have you done any swimming with the sharks yet? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've gone scuba diving with sharks, yeah. Gray nurse sharks, yeah. Because I do a wow. bit of scuba diving. Generally, sharks are not dangerous. You leave them alone, they leave you alone. Oh, I've, I've been swimming with sharks, yeah. Have you ever fought a kangaroo? I've not fought a kangaroo, no. I mean, we, we have kangaroos on our property. I, actually, I mean, probably the da most dangerous thing around here are the cockatoos, because they generally eat your house. Uh, they're a bit like airborne rats. They're gorgeous <laughs> creatures, but they, they, they're very destructive. I mean, that's one of the things why my wife wanted to move over. Julia wanted to move over because she just loves the wildlife over here. Because a few weeks ago, my daughter was over and we went to a place. It's, it's an hour's drive from here. And we were able to see orcas and humpback whales breaching from the water because they, they migrate past here during the winter. Uh, you see dolphins that are just they're surfing the waves. Uh, you see turtles. Uh, rays, all sorts of stuff. Which side of uh, Australia are you on? Uh, east, I'm west, on the north, east south? coast. Uh, so it's Brisbane. So it's kind of midway up the, the east coast. Yeah. Uh, effectively, you're either east coast or west coast. And Perth is the most isolated city in the world. It might as well be in a different country. I mean, it's quicker to get to New Zealand than Perth. Yeah, but you used to live in New Zealand where they shot Lord of the Rings. That's just enough to live there right there. I know, I know. It's great. I mean, I've been to Hobbiton three times. Um, oh, yeah. oh, jealous. Yeah. I've even had the backroom tour at uh, the Weta Cave where you, you know, they did a lot of, make a lot of the stuff. Oh, Lord yeah. Of the Rings. So, yeah, I'm, New Zealand's lovely. It's just, um, you know, we didn't, have a visa that allowed us to stay there. So let's forget about this game stuff. Let's talk about Weta. Mm. All right, so, <laughs> yeah. So was it as amazing as I think it was? I mean, was it just like, wow? The, the backroom tour was good. I mean, I say the, it, the, the front, the, the normal bit is okay. The bit that the public can go to is okay. But the backroom tour, because we were lucky because we weren't filming anything. It's just interesting to see the different processes they use, you know, how they put stuff together. I, I mean, they, one of the incredible things is Whenever um, they're making a film, they, they take a mask of people's faces. So they'll take a mask of an, an actor's face uh, with a latex plastic because they use that for um, working out makeup and stuff like that. But they've been doing this for a long time and directors collect these things. So they have this collection of masks and they actually swap them a little bit like trading cut cards so there's this room and they've just got all of these old masks of people um you know all sorts of film actors you know going back into the 50s and 40s and so on um so i found that really impressive was it not freaky it's a little bit it's a little bit freaky <laughs> we're saying uh and the other thing that impressed me that for some film or somebody that they needed to make some um french artillery 12 pounder cannons and they actually made them just like you know the old airfix kits you know the kind of kits that you we used to make as a kid and you'd have all this plastic mm -hmm. on a sprue that's actually how they made it you got but it's one-to-one -one scale and they kind of so you've got this massive great big french cannon on a sprue on a wall all ready <laughs> to cut out and make i thought that that was pretty impressive so my exacto knife probably wouldn't have gotten through the sprue would it <laughs> i don't think so really don't think so you needed a hell of a lot of glue for that one <laughs> need some big old snips for that one yeah yeah but uh, wow <laughs> But Ho Hobbiton's cool as well. I mean, Hobbiton is an amazing, an amazing place because they, they rebuilt it for The Hobbit. Um, as, I mean, there's a long story behind Hobbiton, but there's very few film sets that ever get preserved. Most film sets, they get put up and then they're dismantled once the film has ended. So it's very rare to actually see a film set that's actually preserved. Now, I will say this. I was just recently over in England on mm. holiday or on vacation, and we went, Marty, did I tell you about my vacation? Just just move on. Hey, okay, sorry. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, Martin, he's, he's been rubbing it in for a couple yeah. weeks. That That's why he said that. So, so yeah. any, anyway, um, funny that you should mention that because in Scotland, Belfast, I believe, where they did the Game of Thrones. Yeah, so you're in Ireland. I did a backstage tour on that, yes, yep. where they did the, the wall 
Mm. They are going to preserve that and allow people to come and visit. They had thought about taking the quarry down, but they are going to actually preserve it so that people can, part of the tourist industry, bring them to the wall yep. and enjoy that series. So that was, I thought that was amazing. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's becoming obviously big business. It certainly was something in like Game of Thrones. I mean, um, yeah, my part, uh, my wife, I mean, she took her kids to Dubrovnik where they did a lot of the filming there as well. So, because yeah, Game of Thrones, that was filmed all over the place, wasn't it? I mean, I think some of the bits in Iceland as well. and Iceland, Spain, uh, all over the UK. And then um, they, they even took us to the back lot of the final season and we got to see some spoiler stuff, which okay. I should have closed my eyes. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, okay. I've been to uh, the Charlotte Motor Speedway where they shot Talladega Nights with Will Ferrell, so... <laughs> Oh, there, there you go. It's, Every, it's everybody there. has a claim to fame. Yeah. <laughs> well, Martin, we have you on the show, not to talk about things that we want to talk about, but things that people want to hear about. And okay. one of that is about uh, you as a game designer, and you have a long, illustrious career as a game designer. And so before we even get into the feature game Wildlands, we want to go way, way back to a young Martin Wallace and ask him, how'd you get into gaming and what games did you get into early on to get into this hobby i mean i think as a kid i'd always been into games it's just you know simple things like monopoly uh stuff like that that was all that was around then i was also into military history you know as, as, as a kid you know i used to like putting together your airfix kits and stuff like that so there's always an interest in kind of gaming but more, probably more war gaming when i was at school there was a teacher who ran a war games club which is quite unusual for the school I went to because it, it was not a posh school. It was a pretty run-down, tough school in Salford. So it's quite unusual to have somebody, a teacher there, that was interested in gaming. So that introduced me into figure gaming. And then I started getting into board gaming with uh, the war games from SPI. I don't know if you remember SPI, Simulations Publications Incorporated. I don't know if that name rings a bell. They're a bit like a cheap version of Avalon Hill. Mm, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean, nowadays, most of this stuff is done through decision games. I think they've got a lot of the licenses. So so the first published game I got was a game called Star Force. And I think I got that when I was about 14, which is probably the most complicated game you could buy that day. I mean, this game, you actually had to do trigonometry to move around the board. It was weird. It's almost unplayable. But yeah, then got into other war games, something like Air War, Third Reich, stuff like that. And then when I was... I think it, was, yeah, it must have been about 18. I got a Saturday job at Games Workshop. And then a few years later, I started working for them full time. So that, that was an important Ooh. part of my education. Because that was back in the days when Games Workshop used to sell everything. I mean, nowadays, if you go into Games Workshop stuff, it's all Warhammer. But back then, they, mm -hmm. they had, uh, I mean, their main bread and butter then was Dungeons and Dragons. Um, that, that's how the original Games Workshop grew into a successful chain of shops. So that gave me a lot of information about the games that are out then. What did you do specifically at Games Workshop? I was just a sales assistant. I, I was bottom of the ladder. I was, um, <laughs> it, it's kind of, okay. it's ki kind of amusing because I, I remember this is the Manchester shop. They, they used to have the London shop and then the second shop there. So yeah, we, we'd see the bosses coming, the big bosses, Ian Livingston and uh, Steve Jackson, the guys who started it. Oh, that's the English Steve Jackson, not the American Steve Jackson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they'd come in for a flying visit and talk to the manager and then fly out again and myself as a lowly shop assistant you weren't involved in that kind of thing the kind of amusing thing is uh, I'm going back to the UK for Essen in a couple of weeks time and I'm, I've got, I'm going down to see Ian Livingston uh, I've got a meeting with Ian Livingston to talk to him about a project because we're both now members well we're both we're in, being inducted into the UK Hall of Fame so I, I kind of feel I've caught up to him a little bit in status I just don't have his money because when I Google the houses on the average house price there <laughs> is eight million pounds. Okay. Oh, so wow. <laughs> okay. So yeah, that, that's kind of cool. So uh, let me get this straight. We've got a distinguished visa. We have a hall of famer on the show, mm. Marty. That's it. <laughs> Rolling dice, taking names. We're done. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we can hang it up right now. I mean, the thing is you've got to remember the UK hall of fame. There aren't that many game designers. Now, I, th I think the distinguished talent is the thing I'm most proud of because I don't think any game designers ever got a visa on that basis because normally you wouldn't have. So growing up, what was your favorite toy? Oh, I used to love Lego. I think that would have been 
have everything. And that, that was before you had these special kits. So, you know, nowadays when you buy Lego, you, you, you're you buying a specific thing. But back then, it was generally you just bought the bricks and you just made up, you know, created what you wanted to create. But yeah, Le Lego was a lot. Yeah, you something about having to use your imagination mm. and things like that versus following a diagram and blueprint. I appreciate yeah. Lego teaching a next mm. level of architects and engineers. But yeah, I mean, I had to design my own car to put my Micronaut in. That's my issue with it, Tony. Uh, nowadays, it's like just kits follow mm. the instructions. When we were growing up, it's just here's some blocks, do whatever you want with it. Yes. Yeah, that's it, because you, you very rarely had any specialist blocks. I, mean, I think the first time I had it, there was a specialist block was you know, when you had uh, Lego wheels. Oh, yeah. And that was you know, amazing, because it's very difficult to make a Lego wheel without wheels. But yeah, everything else, yeah, you've, you've just got the standard parts. You've got very few specialized curves or, well, obviously it's still a great toy because it's still doing well. Although it's interesting how apparently its success is because it still appeals to adults. And they, I think they're marketing a lot of their stuff to adults as well as kids. Well, of course, because it's like, hey, look, a new $200 Millennium Falcon. Who's <laughs> yeah. going to get that? Adults? Yeah, I know. I remember my, my daughter, she studied physics at university, Manchester University. And one of her earlier jobs was to make help make a model of the Large Hadron Collider from Lego. That was a big thing. Oh. <laughs> that was absolutely <laughs> massive. Although it's quite nice. It's, uh, she did a PhD in physics, and she ended up working at the Large Hadron Collider. She was working at CERN for a while on um, oh, you know, the, the Swiss dang. thing. Yeah. It's great, because I went to visit her a couple of years ago, straight after Essen. And um, my flight was cancelled, because they, they do that on a Sunday night. And I ended up going on Monday morning. But I was on the same flight as Bruno Catala, you know, the guy who designed uh -huh. King Domino, yes. who lives down there. So he actually gave me a lift to her village because it was um he lives in the same area so a little shop talk as you're driving oh, down yeah, yeah. The Swiss Alps. <laughs> it, it was great well they have the it was interesting because there was because antoine bowser's down there as well apparently from all of his um money from gaming apparently he's bought a house which is used for nothing but gaming uh, i think sometime i must i must go down there it's just kind of cool this idea where you just go there people are just gaming all the time or play testing yeah my wife wanted to do, do the next holiday she wanted to do the river cruise from paris to zurich yep so i'm, I'm gonna have to figure this out because this sounds like a fun trip for me yes okay just just make sure you take a lot of money when you get to switzerland because it is very expensive all right forget that trip i'm too cheap so you went from uh, being a gamer as a, a young lad to getting a job at Games Workshop as a sales associate. When did you decide, you know what, I want to try my hand at designing a game? I kind of moved away from gaming in my 20s, went back to college to get a degree, and then I started getting back into gaming when my late 20s. And I, So I pretty much started sometime around my, I don't know, 28, 29. I thought, yeah, I think I'd like to try being a game designer or, you know, I'd like to start trying to design games. So yeah, it's round about then. I mean, this is before the internet. You were starting to see Euro games uh, appear, but not, not in the shops. You'd have to know which people to mail order them from, from Europe. So that's when I started. And it was a few years before I had anything that was could be self-published. So the first game I did was Lords of Creation, which I printed off uh, an Apple Mac and just sold mail order. And that's where it started. And that was in okay. 1993. Yeah. And if you go look at the uh, Board Game Geek uh, list uh, for, for Martin, he's got a long <laughs> list of games he has made since then. Yeah, and they're not even all on there, I don't think. Yeah, but I mean, some of them, I mean, to be fair, when, when you're publishing your own games, I mean, I mean, there's some of them. I think there's one game I did because I just did it for S and uh, Cloudbusters, and I think I only did 30 copies. They're all printed at home. So I, I always feel sorry for those people who want the complete Martin Wallace collection because I figure, you know, there can only ever be 30 of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes me ask you the question. What do you think about all this um, Kickstarter stuff as from a standpoint, if you had had Kickstarter back then, would it have changed things? Well, it would have definitely have changed things. I mean, see, the thing is, I, I feel lucky that when I started, there wasn't the internet. So I, I could make... I could establish myself in the industry at a time when there were very few people doing what I was doing. I mean, when I, uh, with the early Warfrog games, they, they were, there weren't many people doing more complex Euro 
a merry trash smash up type games. Um, so you know you could put something out there with very little uh, advertising or anything, and you you could sell a reasonable number of them. And it didn't have to be top quality artwork. People were more interested in the quality of the game rather than the artwork. And because there was no competition, you could go you could get away with that then. Now, as you know. I mean, there's just new games, you know, every day there are new games coming out, partly fed by uh, Kickstarter, because Kickstarter has obviously opened the gates to the industry so anybody can publish a game. Yeah, there, there's a positive side to it, there's a negative side to it. Uh, I mean, the positive side being, yes, it allows certain games to be made that would, would, would never be commercially viable in terms of the amount of artwork they have in them. It allows people, aspiring game designers, it allows them to break into the industry if they're willing to put the time and effort in without having to go through a publishing house. But it also means there's a lot of stuff that gets published that hasn't been properly playtested, that hasn't gone through the kind of development that games used to have to go through uh, when you had a publisher doing the development. So it swings and roundabouts. Um, but for me personally, I'm glad it wasn't around then because now I think it's really hard for somebody to establish themselves as a new name in the industry. I mean, you get a few people like, you know, Jamie Stegmeyer and Isaac Childress, but there are so many. I mean, I come, ac I mean, I, I, I come across so many people who are aspiring game designers. I mean, we have a regular Thursday night meetup with a group of guys and girls. We would all love to get stuff published, but it, it, it's, I don't know, it, in a sense, you, you have to put a lot more effort in now to get something published because it's got to stand comparison with the stuff that is available, already available. Is your wife, Julia, is she one of your main play testers? Has she... Julia has never play tested one of my games. Julia doesn't do games. Uh, the closest we get to a game is playing Banana Grams, but she's not a gamer. She thinks they're all weird. And a lot of gamers so, are a bit weird. So that begs the question, how did you two meet then? Uh, internet dating. Uh, she really? was divorced. Yeah, my second. Uh, I I had a, had kids with a partner, but no, we we met on the internet back in two thousand and four. Oh, that's and cool. And then we got married in two thousand and nine. We share other interests. We love going out walking. I think it's seeing the world. I mean, I, Julia was rather appalled when when she got to know me. She was rather appalled because I tell her about all these places I'd been to for conventions, and she'd say, uh, "Well, what was it like?" And I'm like. I don't know. I didn't leave the convention center. <laughs> yeah. I, you, know, you know, yeah, I'm in Columbus. I mean, I'm at Origins. What did I see? Well, I'm just in a big warehouse, effectively. So she started coming along to conventions with me. And what she would do is tack on a holiday. So I think the most extreme one was where I was invited to a convention in San Francisco. Um, so they paid my airfare, my hotel, and Julia tacked on a four-week RV trip from Denver <laughs> to San Francisco. So we wow. saw a lot of things inside. Yeah, that, that was awesome. Because it, it kind of freaked her a bit. I mean, the very first convention I took her to was one in Lyon in France. And she was amazed when all these people, all these people at convention were all treating me with respect and being really nice to me. And because um, she, you know, <laughs> what, <laughs> what the hell is this? Oh, yeah, in, in France, we call Martin the Prince. <laughs> like, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's nothing like that that companion to bring you back to your Oh, absolutely. Ju Ju Julie would make sure once, once I've been you. on one of these ego-inflating tours, my first job when I get home is, right, you're cleaning the toilets. <laughs> <laughs> we got to bring you back down. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, she, she's <laughs> very, very, head a little she's bit. very good, very good at puncturing my ego. So, yeah, it's keeping me grounded. Because you do, you do see, you know, some game designers, they they – when people are um, complimenting you all the time, or you know, you, you can become quite self-centered, uh, and you do see this, you know, in 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 other people in the industry. So you you kind of sometimes have to realize, you know, actually, yeah, okay, it's nice being a famous game designer, but the reality is, you know, doctors are way more useful. They do something, it seems to me, which is actually practically useful. Whereas game design, it's it's a luxury. Follow up on the toilet cleaning. So mm. everybody's always asked, below the equator, does the water go clockwise or counterclockwise? It doesn't matter. That's a myth. That, 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 is, uh, that is one of those uh, urban myths. 
Yes. I've never actually checked really? it down here, but um, <laughs> no, the cor- choreo. That'd be the a, first thing I would do. No, yeah, it should be, yeah. But um, no, I, I, I've never actually checked it. But I'm, I'm sure I read somewhere it's in there. Speaking of conventions, are you, as somebody who has been in this industry for over a, a couple decades, are you surprised at the growth of the industry? From I'm sure at one time you went to Essen and it was small and Gen Con it was just a few people to explode like it has now? Yeah, I mean, it. I remember years ago that um, with the rise of uh, video games and everybody's saying, oh, this will be the death of board games. You, know, you don't need board games anymore because you can just play a video game. And actually it's been the reverse because the, the, well, I think it's a combination of the internet and people moving from video games to board games has meant that the market's exploded. So yeah, we, we are... I mean, it's great. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I'd been to Gen Con, oh, I think, I think the first one went to, I think might have been 1998. And you could do the trade room in half an hour if you were slow. I mean, there was just, it was tiny. And now you look at Gen Con and yeah, it's getting to be the size of Essen. Um, I mean, it's still not quite there, but yeah, it, it, it's great. And it's also interesting the way that um, games are moving more generally out into public. I mean, I've come across numerous people. Uh, I remember as an accountant, my accountant in New Zealand, you know, he played th- stuff like Ticket to Ride. Uh, I went to I, my doctor, my doctor here in Australia, I went, well, I went to see the doctor and he, he, he looks at my thing, uh, he looks at me and says, oh, he says, here are your game designers. So, is that video games? I said, oh, no, board games. He said, oh, you mean like Railroad Tycoon? And I said, yeah, I designed that. He said, Really? Really? Yeah, yeah, that's one of mine. It's like, oh, can I tell my friends? And I, like, there's that weird inversion of, you know, the doctor-patient thing where suddenly the doctor is in awe of the patient. And so, yeah, it's not, you, you, you're meeting people in the street who've played more than Monopoly, where, which is great. Yeah, that's what's so cool about this industry. We've gotten to the point now where it's, you know, people are like, oh, I used to play, or I play Monopoly or whatever. Now they're moving beyond that. And it's like, yeah, I've heard of Settlers of Catan. I've heard of Ticket, Ticket to Ride. These games are now showing up in big box stores. So uh, it's really cool to go to like a doctor or a friend that you don't think's into, into board gaming and they know uh, all about this hobby. Yeah, I remember uh, when my daughter is at university, she, um, yeah, somebody there said, uh, so what does your dad do? And he says, oh, he's a board game designer. Oh, do I know him? And he said, she said, yeah, because my daughter doesn't have the same surname. So, oh, yeah, it's Martin Wallace. And he opened his drawer and he had a copy of uh, The Witches. He said, your dad is Martin Wallace. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that, that, that caught me off guard. Cause, see, the same thing for me, because I met Glenn Drover recently. Oh, yeah. Railways yeah. of the World is one of my favorite games. See, once again, I'm done, Marty. I can leave this hobby. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you've met your he- heroes because, yeah. uh, uh, Martin, we have, like, every game that we've played of yours recently over the past, or over the several years, we just love. And I was, there's this certain thing about your games that I can't put my finger on. So I'm going to ask you, what is it about your games that are so unique that give it that Martin Wallace flavor? Is there a certain thing that you try to put into it or anything like that? I don't know. I mean, I think I try not to keep doing the same kind of thing. So you're always looking for different ways of doing things. You're always trying to find elegant way of doing things. I mean, if I, if I you know, whenever I'm talking to uh, people who are interested in the theory of design or designing a board, I always say the key thing is that you need to have uh, a set of rules you know, a set of mechanisms that give rise to a greater range of effects than the set of rules that you have. So you, what you're really looking for is kind of emergent behavior from your rules. So you're never sure what the rules are going to be, but you, you're trying to create a small set of rules that result in a complex situation. And, and you don't always see that in modern games. Sometimes you have that kind of one-to-one thing where, yeah, for every effect there's a rule, whereas really you want one rule for five effects. So I, I suppose that's something you're, you're, you're looking for is a relatively simple set of rules that leads to emergent complex behavior. I, I always kind of think it shouldn't be the rules that are complicated. It should be the situation that's complicated. The rules should allow you to play the game without breaking immersion, which, which sort of kind of will feed into Wildlands because that was one of the things when I was designing Wildlands is consciously thinking, how do you make a combat game 
go quickly and smoothly in the way that if you're watching a film, uh, you know, when you're watching uh, an action film, where things happen quickly. Whereas when you're playing a game, uh, if you're playing a war game, as soon as you have something like dice, for instance, all of a sudden there's a pause because you have to check tables and you've got to check how many dice you roll and you have to roll them and you have to check which ones have hit and then the other guy has to roll dice to see if they block any. And for me, that, that, that's a break in immersion. That means you've been taken out of the game and now you're doing something else. And I, I just think one of the things I'm always aiming for with a game design is trying to make sure that in the game you're not being forced out of the game to think about things outside of the game, that you, you're, you're staying immersed in the game. And I thank you greatly for that because as people who listen to the show, they know I love simple mechanics, quick, simple. That, And with Wildlands, when we did the fighting among each other, it was it was easy to understand. There's the iconography. This happens. You play, you play. There may be an interruption, but never did we have to go back to the rule book. And mm. thank you for that. And was that one of your, was that the, what, what was the core mechanic for Wildlands when you started it and did it change? Well, originally the, the, the game came about because I was asked by a Russian company to design a set of rules to allow you to fight battles between armies from different periods of history. So that, that's where the idea came from originally. Uh, but I really struggled with that because as a war game, if you've, if you've got once, you know, two sides and from different periods of history, one side's going to have to be bigger than the other to balance the technological imbalance, which basically means you're fighting the same battle over and over again with a small number of well-armed people against a large number of poorly armed people. I thought, well, that, that's just not going to be satisfactory. So then I thought, well, if we can equalize the numbers and um, then, but still have different types of weapon technology, then maybe we can set up something that's more interesting. So that ended up being more tactical. So originally, I called it Cosmic Warriors, and it was about these super aliens beings who grabbed people from different periods in history, put them together on a team, and made them fight against each other. So that, that's kind of where it came from originally, until somebody, when I offered it to Osprey, they pointed out, yeah, that theme, that's HeroScape, so we can't do that, hence why they came up with Wildlands. But the actual core mechanics actually came from a two-player version of Moongar Invaders. So when I was doing the Moongar Invader Kickstarter uh, years ago, that was my first Kickstarter, I came up with this two-player version, and that had that core mechanic of where you have a card with three symbols on it, and that determines which characters you can use it from. So, yeah, actually the game is a development of an already existing game. And I just took that and expanded it and developed it. Was it your goal from the beginning to uh, create a combat system that didn't use dice? Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not averse to dice. It's not like, I, you know, some of my games have dice in. I just think when I look at miniatures games where you've kind of got these combat games, the thing that slows it down is the dice. I kind of, so I think, you know, if you can find a solution to that, you can speed things up uh, very quickly. So for me, Wildland is an attempt to say, Okay, yeah, let's keep the combat simple, but it's more about how you employ your forces. It's all about, you know, how you use cover, how, whether units can, uh, characters can support each other, which to my mind is way more interesting whether you hit somebody. You talk about that from the line of sight. Mm. Marty and I played miniatures, you know, War Machine, Warhammer, all that. And then, oh, wait, can I see him? We started getting lasers out. Mm. But I think the point is, is that uh, sometimes the line of sight rules and everything just really slow us down like the dice combat. But with Wildlands, you've created a really elegant system. Uh, it's really cool that you've created this miniature type aspect uh, in a board game that really simplifies. You have elevation, you have line of sight, uh, you have combat, you have range combat, you have melee combat. Mm. That's just like in a full miniatures game like 40K or Age of Sigmar but it's simplified down to a more simple tabletop board game mechanic that anybody can jump into and not be scared of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, actually, I mean, the, the, the whole thing about Wildlands, or the original Cosmic Warriors, I mean, the key thing was dealing with opportunity fire. Because I, I don't know if you ever used to play games like, I mean, I used to play a lot of Squad Leader back in the day. And the big issue was always opportunity fire. You know, how, uh, there's always complicated rules about when you can interrupt the other player's turn. And obviously, in real-life combat, Opportunity fire is the key thing in that somebody, you know, if somebody moves out of cover, moves 
across a line of fire, they're going to get fired at. And th there will be mm -hmm. some games where you could do that with impunity because they didn't have decent opportunity fire rules. So, but the reality is, you know, you got in a real combat, you have to be very careful where you poke your head out. So that was a real thing I was trying to model, which is why you have the interrupt system where you don't know if the other person can fire at you. When teaching this game, um, it seems like the interrupt system is the thing that we have to constantly kind of go back and make sure that we mm. understand uh, how we're doing. There's, everything kind of flowed really easily, but the interrupts, a lot of people were used to your magic style interrupts mm. where things go onto a stack and then yep. resolve from the top down. And it, it's funny when you, when you look into it, your interrupt system is a lot easier and we always made it more complicated than what it really is. Person takes an action, somebody can step in and interrupt. Once that's over, somebody else can step in and interrupt. And it all goes back basically to that first person's turn. Yes. But we always wanted to, wait, we want to interrupt you and do something. Somebody else says, wait, I want to interrupt you and, and do something. And you're used to that top down. Last mm. person who interrupted resolves first and steps down, but it's not nearly as complicated as that. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think, and that, that's what adds attention to the game. It, it's always, uh, usually, you know, it would, when I'm introducing it to somebody for the first time, they'll do something simple like, yeah, they'll reveal a character, they'll step out in the open to grab one of the gems, they'll do an interrupt, somebody appears beyond, above them and shoots the hell out of them. And they go, okay, now I understand this game. You have to be very careful when you move out into the open. As someone learns this game, mm. from the designer's perspective, Talk a little bit more about interrupts. So people who, when they first get this, what is the easiest way for them to understand this mechanism? Oh, good question. Hey, dang it. Tony's up one nothing on good questions. Yeah, well, it's a tough question to answer. I mean, what, what I've tried to do in a game is, say you've got asymmetric sides. So what you, have, what you have to realize is that, okay, you've got a team of guys and girls, and all of their abilities have been kind of chopped up and dispersed among your deck of cards. So your deck of cards determines what you can and cannot do. So everything about your team is embodied in that deck of cards. It's modeled through that deck of cards, how fast they can move, whether they're good at melee, whether they're good at range combat, uh, whether they've got any other special abilities. Everything is modeled through the deck of cards. Uh, as, you, as you mentioned, there's a simple icon system. I think that the one icon that trips people up is how you can use a shield. But mm. You have to realize, yeah, there's certain icons block other icons. And it's just remembering which icons block which other icons. You have a simple reference card that yes. people have in front of them to, to double check how that works. Yeah, it doesn't matter how simple you make things. There's always somebody who messes things up. It's, 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 I, there was one guy who was playing it and he, he was looking through his cards. It's like, I can't seem to do anything because he was looking for the symbol that allows you to move. And I had to remind him that all of the symbols allow you to move. It says that, that, that people, when they come to a game, they, they, they bring their own presumptions. You know, they, they, they assume things that aren't necessarily there. So you, you would be surprised how, how easy it is to even misunderstand a simple game. But yeah, I suppose the only other complex thing is the interrupt thing. Is, and yeah, it's just a case of you interrupt. It's sort of your turn, but not fully, because once you've finished, it reverts back to the first player. And that, that was to kind of get over a problem where people would just be interrupting so that they could then pick up three cards because it would be the end of their turn. Mm -hmm. so, so you have to kind of think it as a piece of elastic kind of thing where, yeah, somebody can interrupt, they can do stuff, but eventually then the, the turn will snap back to the original player. So yeah, the game itself I, I see as, as relatively simple. What, what you have to do, though, is think in terms of uh, the situation. So for instance, where you put your objectives, you need to make sure you make life difficult for your opponent by making sure they're spread out. You need to think about how you group your people. So, for instance, if you've got one of the teams which are very good at helping each other because they've got the rally order, which allows you to move yourself and somebody else, you need to make sure that those uh, characters start close to each other so they can work as a team. So you, you, you kind of have to understand the strengths and weaknesses of each team and work out the best way to deploy them, the best way to use them effectively. You already stated what Wildlands was very close to. What game does Wild Lions resemble? Because most players were going to say, hey, if I like this Martin Wallace game and Wild Lions is like this, then I will like Wild Lions as well. So, I don't know because I think, I don't think I've done a game like this before. So no, I, I don't think, ooh, what, no, I can't think of any other game I've done that's close to it. But can you think of any other game on the market that's that's somewhat similar? I know some people said it kind of rem reminds them of Arcadia Quest because it's models on a board fighting each yeah, other. Yeah, possibly. I've, I've, to be honest, I've not played Arcadia Quest. I think when Wild Dance was first 
advertised people saying it might be a bit like Shade Spire, which I've not played yet, but that's another that's a Warhammer arena combat game. Um, but mm-hmm. I think that uses dice, and you don't have as many figures. So I've, I've not played it, so I, w- I wouldn't like to comment on the differences. Yeah, I mean, I suppose, I mean, there's, yeah, I suppose you could say there's a crossover market. So yeah, if you were somebody who liked something like Shade Spy or some of the uh, Games Workshop stuff, you could look at Wildlands as being a way of maybe getting your miniature combat fix, but with a much shorter setup time, in that you flop the board out, choose a side, uh, deal out your map cards, choose your starting positions. So you, you, you can set the game up very quickly. There's no scenery to set up. And then you can be done in half an hour or less if you play really badly. So it could appeal to those people, yeah, who are into war games, who want something that's short and quick, simple to play. But then it could also appeal to those people who might not be into war games who are put off by their complexity and length of play and say, well, no, here is an easy figures game that you can get into, which is... You, you know, you can play in under an hour easily. You mentioned setup, and that's one of the things I love about this game. I love this idea of uh, picking um, five cards as your starting positions and then handing them off to somebody else for them to put their crystals. Mm. That's whole part of the planning process. You're trying to make sure that the cards you give them have crystals spread all, all over the board. Maybe you hope that you get some of the crystals near you so that you can kind of protect them. I just, I just love that mechanic. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I think it works quite nicely because it also lets, allows you to set up traps in that, yes, you, you know that somebody's going to have to go to such and such a place so you can make sure that you've got one of your characters close by ready to jump on them. When, when they get there so but yeah within a within a simple system you know choose five to keep choose any other five go to the next player along i mean then going back to what i was saying i i, I kind of think now when you're designing a game that there are so many games out there that putting unnecessary complexity in the game is going to hurt you in the long term because when people don't play games that often you know they'll play a game once they'll leave it for a few months and they'll come back to it and if you've got a really complex rule set, very often that can be a bit off-putting because you, you're kind of starting from scratch again. So if you've got a rule set that is relatively simple, it's logical, it's internally consistent, and it's intuitive, I think it, more likely people are going to come back to that game because they're not having to start from ground zero of like, oh, I have to read through this whole rule book again. Preach it. Preach yeah. it, brother. Yeah. It, I mean, I used to play horribly complicated games in the past, um, things like air war and stuff like that. But now I, I don't have the brain space to do that. I mean, to your point, I, I think of, we enjoy Starcraft and games like that. And then I, I will say, Marty, we got to get this back out on the table. And then I just opened that rule book and I said, let's play something else. So I yes. completely agree with you on yeah. that. Now I will say with wildlands, you have definitely designed, I don't know if legacy is the right term, but we have two expansions coming out. The is it the Unquiet? Yes, the Unquiet Dead. The Unquiet Dead, which is hilarious, and but then my favorite one, the Adventuring Party. It's got your typical D and D Adventuring Party. Was that you? No, to be honest, I've not seen. I've not even heard of that one. <laughs> it's so, on BGG, man. Is it okay? Uh, no, I, I don't always get informed of these things. Oh yeah, so that's not a very good question, is it? I think it is. No, you see, I, I, I have to be careful because D- Duncan sent me an email. That said, I think the last interview said, you know, you did talk too much about future stuff in Wildlands. So I, I have to be careful what I say because it's somebody else's property in, in essence. But the thing that most excites me about it, though, is it's infinitely expandable in that, I mean, when I, the original design, I had four different maps. So, so far, we've got two of them. And I think I, yeah, I had 12 different uh, factions I've, you know, I've got ideas for future maps, for future teams. I know Duncan has, or the Osprey team, they've got some really good ideas. So the thing that excites me most is that you, you can go in all sorts of different directions. You can add all sorts of rules. It's kind of a sandbox that you can play in. And so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm hoping it, it, it catches because then we'll be able to build the brand with a whole load of content over the years. Yeah, I mean, like you said, you get you can release new boards, new new factions. Uh, you mentioned um, Shadespire. Shadespire just came out. Not Shadespire. Warhammer Underworlds just came out with their new version, uh, Night Vault, which added basically a new mechanic, magic. They added some new tiles on the board that are a little bit different, some additional rules. So that this design space opens up to you for that. 
Mm. If you want to add, you know, like new terrain or ter new terrain type things, new buildings, yeah. new maps, etc. So yeah, this game, this game, like you said, could go on for a while. Oh, hopefully so. You see, you, you yeah, never the man know. needs royalty checks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a full time. And people, people assume I'm, you know, some wealthy game designer in a mansion in Brisbane. But uh, no, it's um, yeah, definitely needed the royalties. One thing I love about the game is, uh, and I love this about a lot of different games, is that there's there's multiple ways to get victory points. Now, typically in miniature games, a lot of the ways to get victory points is you kill the other person. Yes. Uh, that's a very understandable thing. What I like about this is uh, you get victory points from either collecting your crystals or taking out another model. So you could go in there with the ideas like, you know what, main thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to grab as many crystals as, as I can and maybe avoid combat. Mm. Or you go the other way around. It's like, you know, this faction I think is going to be built for fighting. I'm going to go in there and just take people out and win that way. Yes, I think it, it it's also means then you a faction can be not so good at fighting, but also but but can be faster which means they still have a chance of winning against somebody who might be more powerful. So it, it does allow for different tactics. Correct me if I'm wrong, Marty. If you go in there with that fighting attitude, if you don't have the kill shot, you don't get the point. So that's that's a cool rule too. Yeah, that's kind of nice because I, I played a game a few days ago and uh, I had the guild and they have that the one really big tough guy and normally nobody attacks him. And this guy had never played before. He decided to attack him and he did six damage to him and somebody else came along and did the final damage. <laughs> I said, you shouldn't even, the first guy I said, I said, you shouldn't have even started. You know, you should have just left him alone. It's not like he can move anywhere. You, you talk about asymmetric abilities of the factions. How, how do you balance that? I mean, is it trial and error? Is there some sort of mathematical formulas that you're using to balance that, you know, this guy has this many swords, this team has this many ranges and, you know, et cetera. To be honest, it's mostly a feel, you know, you just, I'd like to say it was all done to a mathematically precise manner, but I don't work that way. It's just whatever feels right. And then, yeah, you, you, after you've set the teams up, then you do a little bit of um, fine-tuning. You know, might add a few weapons here or either increase or decrease their hit points. But most of it is just a feel. It's just this, whenever you're designing a game where you're having to create an economy or balance things like that, I don't know. There's just something that just feels right about a certain set of numbers or a certain set of characters. And it's just a feeling. It's like, yeah, generally this is going to be balanced. I mean, they're not perfectly balanced, but then you have to learn how to fight your teams. It's like the guild, they're a tough team to fight because they've got one really tough guy, but the others are quite weak. So you have to play them in a different way than you would play the pit fighters. And that's so in one sense, you say, well, there isn't balance between them because it's also what the players bring to the team to make their team play effectively. Also, another great aspect about Wildlands is when you're playing the cards, you don't immediately get to refill. So when you interrupt, there's the strategy. People are like, oh, there's no strategy. Oh, there's a lot of strategy here. It will hit you in the face if you're not careful. I mean, the card system, I did something similar in uh, the Field of Glory card game that I did a number of years ago, which is based on an idea. It's a friend I used to go to the pub with back when I was back in the UK who was um, a military historian. And he was talking to me about how in battle, certain generals had a concept of tempo. And the, the card system is, for me, a way of modeling that in that you have to know when to hold back and make sure you've got options at hand that you, you, you don't want to go all out because then you don't have the ability to respond. So in a sense, that is kind of a form of tempo of you being able to control the speed of combat. You said that this was originally in a different universe. Did somebody else come up with the idea of Wildlands or they kind of pitch it to and you fleshed out the universe and the factions and the different names or did somebody else come up with that and then ultimately came up with you know the different types of models in each faction but you gave them the abilities? The team abilities are based on the factions that I created but the background and all of the models and the names that, that was all created by Osprey which I think they've done a good job on because I think, I, you know, if I'd been doing it, I might have ended up with just doing more kind of standard fantasy parties. But having these really weird and wonderful characters like the owl guy and the kid who's got the mechanical legs and stuff like that, you've got some very different types of characters, which, which I mean, it seems to me to do two things. First of all, it's just interesting in itself that you've got these weirder array of weird weird array of characters but it also makes them easier to identify on the board because they are so strikingly different from each other so i think that was a very good idea 
to have such a range rather than having five figures that are all vaguely similar with each other that that, that would have made life difficult and the the figures are just gorgeous really good detail you put that little bit of wash on them it just makes the details pop out they did a great job with those they did and it seems to be what's quite nice it seems to be quite uh, resilient plastic because you have to pop the little bases on. I was worried like, oh, when you when you when you're getting them off, where you know, can you pulling on the plastic and is something going to break off? But the plastic they've used seems to be really good quality. But yeah, I really appreciate the wash as well because sometimes when you're just playing straight with straight figures, it always feels to me like you're playing with an unfinished game and that they need to be painted. But yeah, just adding that little wash means like, no, they, they, it's just enough to make it feel like you're you're, you're playing with the final pieces. And in fact, as a uh, tease uh, for this week of Tabletop Showcase, for those who may be interested in wanting to paint those figures, our good friend Joel Eddy over at Drive uh, Through Games is going to be teaching you uh, how to paint these and, and give you some tips. And he's actually going to be giving a full painted copy of the game away. So make sure to go oh, okay. check out his uh, YouTube uh, channel uh, later this uh, week after this episode drops. No, that sounds good. Oh, it's a long time since I painted figures. See, when I was at Games Workshop, that... that Back in the day, that that's when I used to do figure painting. I mean, not very well, but um, but yeah, it would be incredible to see the figures painted. And it's actually figure painting I have found. I thought I wouldn't enjoy it, but it is, for some odd reason, it was very soothing, even though I wasn't good at it. And I slowly got better, but so, yeah. But I'd be scared to mess these up. It's, not, it's knowing all, all the tricks about how, how to paint well, because it's not just simply a case of slapping the paint on, isn't it? It's no, you know, how, when to get, how to get shading effects and dry brushing techniques and stuff like that. Well, Martin, we have played a lot of your games, mm. but we want you to play one of ours. Okay, fine. Like we do with all of our guests, we're going to play a game called Rank 'Em. What we're going to do is we're going to give you three items and you will rank those items in any order that you want and tell us why. Mr. Martin Wallace, do you understand the rules of this game? I understand the rules of the game. Yes. Yeah, see, we like to keep it simple too. Okay. Tony, why don't you kick us off? <laughs> okay. Okay. This, he's already thinking. This game would never make it on Kickstarter. <laughs> well, no. He's like, he's like looking at his watch. Okay, let's get this over with. All right. So the first one is... Henry Ford, James Watt, or Federica Fagan. I think I said his name right. Uh, the Intel design team lead. Oh, James Watt. Definitely number one. I knew it. That was going to be a yeah, easy baby. Guess. <laughs> And for those who don't know who James Watt is, who is that? Well, J James Watt, I mean, he didn't invent the steam engine, but what he did is he improved it. He took the Newcomen uh, steam engine, uh, which relied on atmospheric. It was an atmospheric pressure thing, and he... James Watt improved it by having a separate condenser, which meant you could run the steam engines at a higher power rate. So basically, without James Watt, there's no industrial revolution, and therefore there's no Absolutely. modern society. Tony, I guess that means he has to be first on our list too. Okay, I'm okay. sorry, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> difficult. So the, the third guy, to be honest, I've never heard of him. So the lead Intel. Federico, uh, I think I'm Fagan, yeah, he was the Intel designer of the 4004 Intel chip. It was the first CPU to, to make... It, it started the CPUs. Yeah, I think I'd still probably go with... Yeah, I suppose you... Would you rank him above Henry Ford? This is your list. Yeah, I'd probably... I'd, you'd probably have to say in impact on society, yes, above Henry Ford, because there are other people around at the same time as Henry Ford who are kind of doing similar things. So mm. if Ford hadn't have done them, somebody else would have done that kind of thing. So, yeah, that, that, I'd put Ford... At the bottom, but that's a tough one. Marty? These were tough. So I was trying to go with, with impact, but the all such has had huge impact. So I think I will say James Watt first because he did usher in the Industrial Revolution. Likewise, I'll probably say Henry Ford second, not because just of the whole automobile thing, but he also, you know, he came up, one of the uh, first people that came up with assembly lines. And assembly line production is like a major form of manufacturing and production right now. And then not, not far behind him is that that other guy I've never heard of, but computers are pretty important. Yes, they are. We wouldn't be able to do this today. So <laughs> no, <we wouldn't. laughs> and I, I would agree um, 
with Martin here. I'm going to go with Watt, Fagan, and then Ford. And it's mostly just for the impacts on my life because of just how computers have impacted me. That's why he's number two over Henry Ford in the automobile. All right, here is uh, my list. Here we go. Z scale, H O scale, O scale. So this is all railway scales. Ah, uh, ding, 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 ding. Did you ever play with the uh, toy trains growing up? Yes, I did. I did have a train set, and that was H O scale. And for those who are, why you come up with those? Just the scales are basically this. The Z scale is one uh, two hundred twenty. H O scale is one to eighty seven, and the largest train scale is O one to forty eight. So that's the largest train. I'd have to go with H O first, but then the Z, and then the O, because I think an H O. I suppose just because you can produce a model train that's got enough detail so it's meaningful, but it's not oversized. I find the larger train models not as satisfying. A lot of the pleasure in a model railway is all, it's not the trains themselves, but it's also the scenery. So yes, at a Z scale, you can get a lot more scenery in. Have you, have you ever been to Hamburg? Are you, so you, are you into model railways then, or is that something? Um, I, I, was, I was as a kid, and I picked this just because of the several games that you've covered based right. on trains. Yeah. So I figured you had to be in trains at some point in time. A long time ago. But I, I was never actually into train games. That, that was just because John Borrow of Winsome Games asked me to design a train game. But train games were never a passion of mine. It's only after that that I started reading up on the history of trains. But if, if you ever go to Hamburg... So you, you have to visit uh, the Wonderland thing there. They have this amazing, these various different train model scenarios set up, uh, scenery. Uh, it's, an, it's an incredible sight. Sorry, I'm, I'm taking notes. Uh, Hamburg, what was that, Wonderland? Wonderland. All right, Tony, you're up. I'm still taking notes here. I'm also, okay. who, who was the gentleman I have to send a thank you card for asking you to design a train game? I <laughs> know oh, you, you don't want to send him a thank you card because we're best of enemies now because we fell out over it. Oh, so, uh, okay, never mind. Best of enemies. Yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> yeah. All right. It would be H O scale, Z scale, O scale, and uh, H O because that's what I played with. Z scale with a magnifying glass because I doubt I could figure out how to put them on the tracks anymore. And I never did like O scale. They they were just it was just way too big. I took up too much room. Wow, then we are going to be very similar here because I'm the exact same way. I grew up playing with HO scale. That is the most popular scale. I had the most fun with those my little Lionel train set. Z scale, because Martin, like you said, uh, terrain and the stuff is really cool. And with Z scale, you can get a lot of terrain on the board. It just looks amazing. And O scale, uh, same way. It just looks kind of big and bulky to me. So Bessemer process for steel, the Haber-Bosch process for fertilizer, or the Heatley penicillin process. Oh my gosh. Where'd you come up with this stuff? This was not off the top of your head. I researched my man here. <laughs> uh, probably Harbour Bosch first, um, because without that, there's no civilization. We would not have the world we have now without fertilizer. There's just so much stuff we take for granted. Bessemer process. So it's the Bessemer process and penicillin. Probably the Bessemer process second. That's, that's a tough one because the, the best, you know, now actually in a sense, no, you'd probably have to put penicillin as second because you need the Harbour Bosch to keep people alive. Well, without Harbour Bosch, you don't have the scale of population that we have. Without penicillin, you just, there'd just be too much disease. So it'd probably be penicillin second, Bessemer process third because even before the Bessemer process, you still had ways of, I mean, Bessemer is just speeding up the production of steel. It's not a new way of creating steel. Steel's been around for a long time. It's just made, doing it in a more efficient way. I'm way too stupid for this uh, uh, rankum. I, I like our old, you know, <laughs> vanilla, strawberry, yeah. and, and chocolate rankums of the early days. So I, I'm just going to leave it to an expert, and I'll say exactly <laughs> what Martin said, <laughs> fertilizer, penicillin, and the Bessemer, because I figure uh, he knows what he's talking about. And then for me, I'm going to go with the same, but the reason why I'm rank ranking them is just the stories behind them on how they came about. I mean, like Martin pointed out, I mean, the Harbor Bosch, they were, it was the, they were running out and Germany needed ammonia for explosives. Yep. And then um, Heatley on the penicillin process, when they were trying to make enough penicillin, they couldn't do it quick enough and people were still dying. And the, the interesting thing is someone tried to take credit for his work. And then the Bessemer process, well, it just made 
us build things quicker, better, stronger, faster. That was it. All right. I, if all of a sudden that sounds really interesting, this Haber Bosch process, is there like a documentary or something somewhere I can watch or, or something I can read? Because that, that kind of sounded interesting to me because that's something I know zero about, but I can totally see the importance of it. So where can I get educated? I don't know. I mean, I don't know if there's a documentary. I just, you know, it's mentioned in a couple of history books. I think that there's just certain things that get overlooked in the general history books because they tend to concentrate on politicians or generals or, you know, and the, th the thing that moves our world, the thing that uh, allows it to advance is technology. And it's not always glamorous. It's usually quite mundane down to earth, but the world we live in is the result of technological developments, nothing to do with politicians, nothing to do with generals. It's just, we, we, a lot of relatively unknown scientists designing stuff, you know, creating stuff that, that allows us to shape the, you know, that has a, created the world we live in. All right. My last one's a little bit less cerebral. Okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, or we're going to go from the head to the stomach. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> Bread and butter pudding, mm. jam roly poly, spotted dick. Oh, definitely bread and put butter pudding number one. Definitely. I mean, that's a guilty pleasure of mine if I'm back in the UK, if I have room after the main meal. But yeah, bread and pudding, butter pudding, number one. Probably spotted dick, number two. The problem, the problem you've got with those is things like spotted dick and jam roly-poly, they're kind of, uh, very often the kind of stuff you had when you were at school, and they weren't always done very well. So very often, you know, you get a really poor spotted dick with this disgusting custard on top that had never seen any milk or sugar. So sometimes you kind of have a negative memory of these things, but probably spotted dick next and then jam roly. I thought jam roly poly was just not a terribly exciting dessert. Yeah, it sounded good for some reason. I saw a picture of it. I thought it looked pretty good. Have you never had these things? Oh, no. No, I, I, I have not. You, you've never had bread and butter pudding? No, it's not a thing here, really, in the States. I was over in London, and I didn't even see that on the menu at some of the places we went. I think it might be more of a northern thing, but mm. still, yeah. If you're ever back in the UK again, if, you, if you're up north, and it's bread and butter pudding, you should try it. It's very good. So, wow, you, you're you being asked to rank stuff that you've never eaten. I got a description here. So, before Tony, before you do yours uh, list, let me just tell people what this is. And, you know, better yet, Martin, why don't you tell us what it is? Bread and butter pudding, what is that? Okay, so you, you take stale bread and you line a container with it and then you fill it with a custard mixture and raisins and then you bake it so that it has caramelized surface and, and that's basically it i'm guessing i mean i, I don't know 100 percent. it's one of those kind of uh desserts which is designed to use leftover stuff and it sounds odd it's like bread and custard does not sound like a good combination but it really works well uh spotted dick is just like a very thick cake it's just like uh, it's very stodgy uh again so you've got raisins and currants stuff like that in it but if you think of a really really heavy Christmas cake that's kind of spotted dick. And then jam roly-poly, it's pretty much what it says. It's kind of a, a lighter cake thing. In It's like a Swiss roll with jam. And, and it said both of those were made with, is it suet? S-U-E-T? Yes, yes, they were. Yeah, suet. That, that. Which I had never heard of, and I had to look that up. That is hard white fat on the kidneys and loins of cattle, sheep, and other animals. Yes. Used to make food, including puddings, pastries, and mincemeat. Yep, yep, yes, suet. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I think nowadays they have modern replacements for suet. But yeah, back in the day, not necessarily very good for your health. But Yeah, it sounds like it would be like if we used... Tony, like we we use lard today yes. in cooking, yeah. like in yeah. pies and stuff. Lard and suet, mm. pretty much the same thing, I think. Yeah. All right, now Tony, yours. How how would you you, you just got you went there? You're sitting in a uh, nice little English restaurant. Which of those three would you order first or or last? Basically, whichever order you want to go. I'm looking at the menu. I just finished up my awesome fish and chips, and I'm thinking, mm, what's going to finish this off? And I see these names. I'm going bread and butter pudding. Then I got to go with oh. We're out. The kitchen has sold out. Well, then I've got to go with jam roly poly because 
when I see spotted dick, which actually I have tasted, and I would have said, mm, I think I need to wait for the third. If you're out of uh, the jam, jam's good. I need to go. I'll, I'll go with that second. And then I'll, I'll do spotted dick. But I have tried that. Actually, we had it at a Christmas party. I would have not put bread and butter pudding first on this list. But Martin, after hearing you explain it and talk about how good it is, I'm shifting all the way to the top for me now. <laughs> Yep. I really want to try that. Then the jam roly poly and the spotted dick. And I would like to say that we got through that entire thing without making one joke about it. Yeah. I mean, come on, grow up, people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. I think that we I think that was uh, we should commend ourselves for getting through the entire discussion of spotted dick without one innuendo joke. Yes. Pat ourselves on the back. That's why my rankings were where they are, because we have to raise the bar here, and now you need to go out. <laughs> yeah, so, so let me get this straight. We went from the Haber-Bosch process down to Spotted Dick. Is that what you're telling me, Tony? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> now, uh, now, in doing my research, as we try to be prepared, Martin, is I know that you said that you would love to do a civilization game. Mm, yes. Um, I know generally you don't speak about future projects and that's fine, but have you started your process? Have you thought about it? Are you ready to begin that journey? I've thought about it, but I haven't properly begun it. Uh, the problem I have at the moment, I've got a lot of other projects that I need to get out of the way first. So kind of when I've cleared the decks a little, then I can start to think about it properly. It, it may not be doable. I don't know. Sometimes you, you, you know, you have an idea that you want to do something and you know, you've got this vision in your head, how it can be done. And then when you sit down to do it, the reality is, yeah, it doesn't work out the way you want it to work out. I think, I think I'm fairly confident I'm going to make a proper start on it next year. What other future projects can you talk about that's already been maybe announced or something? Anything else you want to share before we uh, close this out? Oh God, that's a difficult one actually. Cause th there is. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll mention one. I'm working on a game called Runestones, which I'm planning actually on publishing myself. I'm vaguely going back to publishing. I hadn't formally thought of doing it, but I think I'm accidentally falling back into publishing again, which is a, a game concept. It's, um, where it's a game where there is no cardboard in the game at all. Ooh. So you've got these kind of uh, Ma Yong-style domino pieces, and these are your units, but they also have values on them. So you, you, they're multi-use pieces. So effectively, you, you've got a set of dominoes, which have got different types of units. So infantry, cavalry, hordes, dragons, because it's, it's, it's a fantasy war game. And when they're in your, um, you know, basically when they're in your hand, you can use them for movement and you can use them for combat. But if you want to build a piece, piece you actually put the piece on the board. So then it's, and because these, the, these pieces cycle, it's then out, out of your deck cycle. So effectively, the dominoes you can think of as cards. The, the map will be made out of cloth. Uh, it'll come in a zippable cloth bag. So there'll be no cardboard in the game at all. Uh, it's an asymmetric war game, so each faction is different. So you've got one side with giants, another side with mages, another side with dragons, another side that's got more ships than other people, and another side which is kind of like your standard humans. So they, they have more cavalry and they have more castles i kind of figure it's going to be an expensive game to do so uh, the, the, uh, the model at the moment is it's going to be kickstarter only so I'm, I'm talking with a few other people who i worked with in australia about running the kickstarter for me because i'm rubbish at doing kickstarter so i need some people who know what they're doing that's something that i've got planned for next year and there is something else which has the potential to be massive but i don't think i can really talk about it when it comes out it'd be Wow, Martin Wallace did one of those games. I can't believe that because it'll be the first time I've wow. ever done something like this. Well, that's what we have kind of felt about Wildlands with the miniatures. If, if this works, it will be massive, but I need to talk to some people at Essen first, so I can't really say anything publicly about it. They don't know about it yet either, but um, I'm hoping they go, wow, this, game, this idea is amazing, but we will see. So you obviously will be at Essen. And yes. And then the con season starts back up mm, again, yeah. and you have a lot of fun. I'm just curious, how long is that flight from Australia? Australia to Dubai is 14 hours, and then Dubai to Manchester is another nine hours. So it's about 23 hours in all. Well, again, it's funny. It's like you think it's tough. You think you know you're flying from one side to the other side of the world in less than 24 hours airtime. That is amazing. That is actually 
incredible. And then people moan about it. And it's like, no, this is just amazing. And it wouldn't have happened without the Haber Bosch process, because if we didn't, couldn't, you know, have food. Yeah. See, yeah. It all goes back to fertilizer. It does. It does. Yeah. I mean, it used to take 80 days is what I hear. Uh, somebody wrote about it, I think. That's what Jules said. Yep. Yep. It did. It did. Well, it used to be um, <laughs> when England, uh, back in the day before air travel, when England did, were doing a cricket tour of Australia, you know, you're away from home for six months because you, you, you sail there and it takes, you know, I don't know, it takes about a month maybe to sail then, to sail from the UK to Australia. So that's a different speed of life back then, where it's like, yeah, I'm going to go to America, take, I don't know, 10 days to get there or something across the Atlantic, if you make it, if you don't hit an iceberg. <laughs> oh, yeah, too soon. But yeah, nowadays, we, we, we're so impatient, aren't we? Oh, I've got to be there before I, well, actually, when you fly from Australia to America, actually, you do get there before you took off, but that's just international time zones but yeah people are impatient now they just want to get there as quick as but we live in an amazing world yeah we do and uh it's been an amazing time sitting and uh talking with you uh, uh martin i've been a fan or we've been a fan of yours for a very long time and the opportunity to sit and and talk to you about your past and and what you're doing with wildlands and now i'm excited about this thing that you can't tell us about that people's gonna <laughs> it's gonna blow people's minds and even this uh domino game tony you and i just talked about this game called war chest from um aeg which is an asymmetric game using poker chips so this sounds uh, really cool too so there's another game i'm excited about this is supposed to be coming on kickstarter soon this one of yours lincoln i backed it so i cannot wait yeah. to uh try it my shelf is just full of your games and before we let you go martin we w we couldn't let you go without asking you one more question that our fans wanted to ask and that is this do you own a lawnmower and if so what kind lawnmower yeah i got a lawnmower i can't remember what type it is because normally julia does the mowing because it's good exercise I mean, where we are, we have uh, an acre of land, so we got. I mow the grass every now and again. Is it push or are you ride? It's push. It's not a ride on. No, um, we were told ride ons are really high maintenance. You really have to know what you're doing with them. So this is just a, a simple push. Fortunately, we, because it's a dry season, the grass isn't growing at the moment, so uh, I've not had to mow the lawn for a while, which is good. That's a really odd question. <laughs> we're, we're, <laughs> Just adding on to that, when, when we were in New Zealand, we did buy a property over there. We had five acres of land. So we actually had a stream running through the land. And to keep the grass down, the house came with alpacas because they're really good at eating the grass. So, oh. Yeah. And see, I want to retire with sheep. And, oh, yeah, alpaca, that would work. You don't want sheep. The maintenance of sheep is messy. Yeah, alpacas are certainly cuter. The, the thing with alpacas is they all poo in the same place. They have what's called a midden system. So you can't step in alpaca poo because you have to be stupid to miss this great big mountain of alpaca poo. <laughs> um, so they're really clean. And the maintenance is less than sheep. Sheep, you have to do this weird stuff where you have to dock the tails and you have to clean them out between the hind legs. And it's really messy and distressing for the sheep. So probably goats over sheep. Maybe that's another rankum. Sheep, alpaca, and goats. It's, I have <laughs> jotted that down, sir. How, how, how about this? Well, uh, how about this? When you're ready to announce this big game, we'll have you back on the show, and we'll have that as part of the rankum. Okay, fine. If he'll come back after our weird question <laughs> on lawnmowers. Okay, well, Martin, once again, thank you so much for everything you do for the board gaming community. We really do appreciate you coming on to the show and giving us some of the greatest games we've ever played. Take care, be safe, heading over to Essen. And if you're at Essen, guys, go up and say hello. <laughs> He's famous. He has won awards. Yeah. He's a Hall of Fame, baby. <laughs> He's Hall of Fame, baby. No, it's been great to be on. No, thank you. Thank you for giving me the chance to um, interview me. Thank you. That concludes the Martin Wallace interview. Thank you all for listening. And do want to give a quick shout out because we need to wrap this up marty because if we keep talking we may run into ourselves from the future <laughs> and space right. space time continuum may explode or something but um to, we brought the interview to you without commercial interruptions and we want to thank our sponsors as always the broken token portal games and of course miniature market thank you uh for sponsoring rolling dice and taking names but Marty, there was one thing that people who don't normally listen to our show may have been a little confused about, and I think you might want to explain that. I think Martin Wallace was confused about I it. I think so he, he was too. 
<laughs> I mean, we're the sheep about, didn't even throw him off. The sheep didn't even, yeah, but now, yeah, go ahead. We asked him about the whole lawnmower thing, which really threw him off. And we've had this soap opera going on, gosh, what, since uh, January, Tony, since yes. you had a, a lawnmower break on you and you've had to have issues of buying a new lawnmower. It tends to come up every episode where listeners want to know, what's the story with the lawnmower? And all of a sudden it's turned into every time we have somebody on our show, our listeners say, make sure to ask what type of, type of lawnmower that he has. So now it's it's become a thing. So uh, Martin was super confused, just scratching his head like, what are these idiots asking about? And we probably just ruined the chance of him ever coming on the show again. But at least now we know what lawnmower he has. And Tony, we learned about alpaca poo. I know. See, we always bring education to the show. People thought they were going to learn about Martin Wallace and his design process, but instead we learned about alpaca poo. And then I had to go look up a picture of it, and it looks like little berries. Okay, sure. It looks like a cluster of like grapes or berries. Okay, and it's not square like wombat poo? We've learned things on this show. I didn't know about square wombat poop. We've learned that over the past six years, and now we've learned about alpaca poo. When you don't have those types of creatures around, you don't know what kind comes out of their bodies. Right. And he also convinced me that I really don't want to raise sheep. I mean, my whole retirement was around going and raising sheep uh, in the Orkney Islands. And he told me just what a messy kind of nasty thing it is. I got to go back to the drawing board and figure out what I'm going to do when I retire. Hey, yeah, I can make fertilizer. That seems to be pretty lucrative. Uh, yeah, it keeps the world living. That's for sure. So once again, <laughs> appreciate everybody taking time listening to the Martin Wallace interview. By all means, please let us know what you think. And if you liked it, come back. We've got a couple other designers lined up in the future. Matter of fact, on our next show, we have Ignacy Chevyshek. If you like what you heard here in this episode, please make sure to go check out all the other content from the Tabletop Showcase. Videos from Secret Cabal about uh, Osprey and Martin Wallace's design process to how the game is played from Watch It Played, how to paint the figures from Joel Eddy, a full game play uh, review and replay from Board Game Replay, and a special look at Osprey Games itself from Chaz Marler. You can find all those on the website at tabletopshowcase.com. But until later, Keep rolling dice and taking names. Once again, a very special thank you to Martin Wallace for joining the show. If you'd like to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Dyson Names. Instagram, Dyson Names. Join our BGG Guild 1589 or like us on Facebook. Dang it, Tony, with all that talk of desserts during Rankham, I totally forgot to ask him whether he has ever tried a moon pie before. Yeah, we throw him off with lawnmower, then we throw him off with moon pie. I don't think he'd ever come back on this show. 